Hey guys, it's Mr. Stratton. Today I want to talk to you about experimental design. In AP Biology, we have these three essential outcomes, which really are called science practices. What they are, the first one is scientific questioning. So in other words, coming up with ideas, hypotheses to come up with the second thing, which is experiments, so planning and implementing data collection. And then finally, being able to analyze that data. So these are three of the five science practices in AP Biology. So today I just want to talk about experimental design. So the very first thing you're going to have is an ex a scientific question, something that you've always wondered about. And something that makes a good question, it has to be testable. So something that you can design an experiment to test. In other words, you can't ask a, an ethereal question like, oh, uh, is, uh, is UV radiation bad? You know, or what's better, chocolate or vanilla? That's not a scientific question. Instead, it has to be something like, um, you know, does UV radiation cause increases in melanoma in rats? Right? That's something you could design an experiment to test. So you would put rats under differing amounts of UV radiation and measure the amount of, of uh, cancer they got, right? Skin cancer. So uh, the results also have to be meaningful, right? Answering, uh, you know, what do people prefer more, chocolate or vanilla? Scientifically, that's not really a relevant question. But uh, you know, definitely knowing about UV and the link to melanoma, that would be a, a scientifically meaningful answer. So for us, as since you guys are teenagers, I thought about this age-old question. Does chocolate cause acne? We'll find out. So the very first thing you want to do is come up with a claim or a hypothesis. So there's actually two different hypotheses that you have to design. The first one is going to be your alternative hypothesis, which is an if-then statement. So if we do X, then Y will happen. Now, I want to go ahead and dispel this myth. It doesn't have to be an if-then statement. There are plenty of great hypotheses out there that are not if-then statements. But if you're having trouble coming up with a hypothesis, this is a good framework for you to consider. An even better one would be an if-then-because statement. If we do X, then Y will happen because scientific concept. Okay, the null hypothesis is sort of, I call it the Eeyore hypothesis. Oh, it doesn't matter. Nothing's going to change. There's no difference between your experimental and your control group. That's what you're going to say. So if we do X, then basically nothing will happen. The, two, the groups will all be the same. Y will not change. So with our chocolate acne experiment, think, of, think for a minute and write down what your alternative and null hypotheses would be. Okay, hopefully you paused the video and came up with your hypotheses. For, for our alternative hypothesis, it's going to be if we feed students a differing amount of chocolate, then the amount of acne will increase because, well, we would hopefully come up with some scientific concept as to why it would cause acne. So an experiment's going to allow us to change those conditions and actually test our hypothesis. There's a couple of variables we have to consider. The independent variable is the thing that I am going to change. So independent starts with I. I would change the independent variable. It's the thing I'm going to manipulate or change. The dependent variable, that depends on what happens in the experiment. That's the thing you measure. So in this case, what's our independent variable going to be? It's going to be chocolate. And our dependent variable? It's going to be acne. So, when you're designing an experiment, one really important thing to consider is going to be the amount of the independent variable. So, for example, testing out a vaccine, like they're doing right now for COVID, they aren't just testing one amount of the, uh, the virus or the RNA or whatever it is that they're injecting, right? They're actually testing multiple different values. So, with our experiment, we could give a human chocolate. Okay, great. But it's even better if we give them different amounts of chocolate. So get a bunch of humans and sp split them up into different groups and give them different amounts. You also need to worry about what are called confounding variables. Those are things that are going to um, possibly confound your results. That means confuse. So what other things could possibly cause acne? Well, it could be diet. It could be your genetics. It could be the amount of water you drink how much exercise you get, your exposure to UV, and hygiene. All those things are going to play a part. Personally, I think that the biggest determining factor in this case would actually be genetics, something you can't control. But you can, you can account for it by having a large sample size. 
because the genetics will kind of even out across your, your huge group of people. So when they're testing the vaccines right now, they're looking for 30,000 people to test on. So to rule out the confounding variables, you have to use a control group. That's going to be a group that does not get the independent variable or it gets a placebo, a fake version of the independent variable. So that allows us to then compare our experimental group or groups, the ones that get the independent variable, to the control group that doesn't. And any difference between them has to be due to the independent variable. So in our experiment, we can go ahead and give somebody no chocolate, but then they're going to know and maybe their stress level will go down. So that's going to maybe confound our results. So really it's better to give them a placebo. In this case, carob, which is what those pods are there. Those are That's what they make fake chocolate out of. I've never personally tried it, but it doesn't look very good. So um, you also want to, like I said earlier, have a huge sample size. You want as many people as you can get in your experiment. Or you want to repeat your experiment multiple times. So in this case, how could we reduce our error? We could not just have one person, we could have a bunch of people. All right, so we've done our experiment. We had 30,000 people. We fed them chocolate. We measured the amount of acne they got. Well, how do you measure acne? You can do it as a non-numerical perception, what's called a qualitative observation, but that's, yeah, that's just you saying, hey, you know what? They seem to have more acne, but that's not really a great data, a great set of data. Better data is numerical data, quantitative data. That would be saying something like the subjects that ate chocolate have 18% more acne. Once you've got your data, you're going to represent it in graphical or uh, table format. So graph is really the way to go because you don't have to sit there and look at the individual numbers. You can see the relationship between the variables by just looking at either a, a bar graph or a line graph or, or, or even other kinds of graphs. But in this case, I'm looking at this and I see that my independent variable, which is the amount of chocolate, is on the x-axis. And my dependent variable, the number of zits, is on the y-axis. And I do notice right away that my zero chocolate group has the least amount of acne. Now, does that, does that prove my hypothesis? you got to be careful. Okay, We'll talk about that in just a second. But I look and I see that my 4 grams a day, my 8 grams a day, my 12 grams a day, they all have more than my, my uh, zero, my control group. So it's, it's leading me towards a conclusion, but I really need to do some statistical analysis on this. So we're going to start with descriptive statistics. So I'm not going to go into inferential statistics today or even descriptive statistics to any real depth. We'll do that later. But descriptive statistics just tell you, you know, mean, standard deviation, standard error of the mean. And uh, inferential, later on, we're going to be doing some a little bit more complex calculations that will tell us if there's a difference between our groups. But if I did some just descriptive statistics on this, I could find that I can make error bars using my standard error of the mean. Those error bars tell me how confident I am in my data. It has to do with like the, the range of values and all that kind of stuff. And so looking at this, I see my error bars from the zero group are down here. I, I want to say my data point is seven, but I look and I see that it really extends up above eight and below six, meaning that that's my confidence interval there. That's, that's, that's where I feel comfortable that my data falls, somewhere in that range. Whereas my four, eight, and 12 groups, they all are up here. I can see that they increase, but I look and I see that these bars overlap, and that's really the key you're looking for. If the bars overlap, you cannot say that those are different because my four group could be up as high as nearly 14, and my eight group could be down below 12. Uh, so those overlap. I can't say they're different, but it looks like my zero grams a day is different. So what that tells me then is that if people have zero chocolate, then they have fewer zits. So that proves my hypothesis, right? Well, okay. I'm going to say it supports my hypothesis. Don't, scientists don't like the word prove, right? It sounds a little too concrete. So my results suggest they support my hypothesis that chocolate causes acne. So by the way, if my data, if all the error bars overlapped, I wouldn't say my hypothesis was wrong. I would say it wasn't supported or I would go to my null because my null is now correct. But you don't say that. You say, I failed to reject my null. Yeah, I, I don't know why we do that, but it's just a science thing, right? So uh, in this case, I reject my null and I'm supporting my hypothesis. Just as a side note, I want to let you know this is all made up and this is not true. They, data seems to suggest that there is no link between chocolate and acne. 
So this is going to be one of the most important aspects of your lab report or your CER is you interpreting your data and telling me what it means in terms of science. So um, what would you do differently if you did this over again? Sources of error. So sources of error would be things like, hey, you know what? I had I really had a small sample size or um, you know what? I, I had more more males in one group than in the other groups or um, I only tested this in California in the sunny sunny climate right that's all something that I would need to worry about so what could people do to expand on this well they could actually break down chocolate into its constituent components and figure out which one of those is actually causing this so here's what your task is so you're going to design an experiment to test the effect of a variable on photosynthesis in aquatic plants. So um, what we notice is that aquatic plants do something called purling. That's where they release bubbles of oxygen. And so more bubbles means there's more photosynthesis. Fewer bubbles, less photosynthesis. So whatever variable you choose, it could be anything to do with light or temperature or pH or um, uh, different colors of plants, whatever, right? But you have to account for the fact that there's, you know, plants are different. Um, so tell me what your problem or your question is your claim and hypotheses, so alternative and null, and then design your experiments, your independent group, independent variable, excuse me, dependent variable, experimental and control groups, and tell me possible confounding variables you would have to consider. And then assuming that your hypothesis is correct, what would your data look like? And what would it tell you about photosynthesis in aquatic plants? Okay, we will discuss this, this next time. So um, thinking back, hopefully now you're able to come up with scientific questions, and design an experiment to collect some data, and then in, be able to interpret that data, at least in, in a simple form at this point. So thank you, and I hope that that was helpful.